Oh, good morning and welcome to Olivet Community Church. We are blessed and honored to have you with us on this Lord's Day. If you're visiting with us today, we uh, want to say a special word of welcome to you. We're Olivet Community Church, and my name is Pastor Dave, and we are continuing to worship, even in the midst of the crisis, we're continuing to worship together online, praying for one another, lifting each other up, listening for the word of God, and uh, worshiping him together. Later on in our service, we'll have an opportunity to come to the Lord's table. So I invite you, you can press pause for a second, um, get some juice, get some bread, and prepare your hearts through the course of our worship service to come with us to the Lord's table. And if you're visiting with us or even a longtime member, would you bless us by texting your name in any way that we can pray for you or rejoice with you or walk beside you, would you let us know by texting your name to 812-457-9509. And we will see that on our church phone and we will respond if there are any needs or any ways that we can serve you. In the meantime, let's join together across the miles, across the states, even across the globe, and lift up the name of Jesus. Will you join us? interesting, isn't it, that corona means crown. We think of it in terms of the corona of the sun during an eclipse when you can still see 
the flames of the sun around even the eclipsed body of the sun. But there's nothing that will ever eclipse the glory of the risen Lord. And, and we have a choice that we can make, don't we? We can choose to surrender to fear. We can choose to surrender physically or emotionally or spiritually to the pressures that are so tremendous during this time of crisis. Or, or we can recognize that there is one who is Lord over physical illness. There is one who is Lord over fear. There is one who has conquered even sin, disease, and death. And he is worthy of our worship. We're going to focus today on this amazing person of Jesus Christ. You recall that we're studying together, using as an outline of our study of the word, the Apostles' Creed. And last week we began, and I invited you to memorize, we in, in began with that first phrase of the Apostles' Creed, and, and we have expressed it in terms of we, not I. We believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Remember that? Well, today we're going to move forward. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Let's celebrate that. Pray with me, would you? Oh, Jesus, thank you that you left the glory of the presence of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, that you humbled yourself and became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus, thank you that you experienced everything that we experienced and you overcame. And God, Thank you so much that, that you honor that by giving Jesus a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that he is Lord. And so we add our voices to myriad voices today, proclaiming his greatness. Oh God, we're afraid. We, we're human. We're broken. We're helpless apart from you. But everything changes because of Jesus. So today we add our voice to myriad voices who proclaim Jesus Christ is Lord. Will you say that with me, beloved? Jesus Christ is Lord. And together, together, God, we lift up your great name. Be glorified. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
great privilege is to come together to the Word of God today. Because we're celebrating communion today, I'm going to jump right in, if that's okay. I want to, I want to get right to God's Word so that we have time to celebrate His great name together at the conclusion. But as we begin, I just wanted to stop for a second and ask you, how are you doing? How are you doing? Seems like such a simple question, doesn't it? When we ask each other almost flippantly every day. But, but in this time, in this season, it has so much more meaning. We're asking, how are you doing physically? Because there's people in our midst. I think of Suzanne and Denny this morning who are struggling right now, to battling to overcome this physical challenge. But there are many in our midst. One precious brother was just sharing with me this morning about his, his daughter who cries every day just from the stress and the pressure of what she's experiencing without even having the disease. Still others, still others are wondering, where are you, God, in the midst of this? You know what I love about God's word is that no matter what we're tempted to believe, his word speaks truth to us. Toward the end of his life, the apostle Paul was imprisoned in Rome. And word arrived to him about one of the churches that he had planted. This church was in Macedonia, the church of Philippi. You know it through the book of Philippians, right? Paul had a special place in his heart for the Philippians. And, and it comes out powerfully in 
this letter of Paul to the Philippians, would you take a moment and just open your Bibles or turn your phones on to the book of uh, Philippians? And we're going to kind of do a, a, a quick overview of the first couple of chapters of it together today. Paul writes in the beginning in verse 3, I thank my God, he says of the Philippians now, in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy, thankful for your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I, my heart just resonates with the, apostles, with the Apostle Paul's because I feel the same way about you. Whether you're a, a family member of the Olivet Community Church or a personal family member or part of our spiritual family scattered all over the world and people that unite around the name of Jesus, I'm thankful for you, for our partnership in the gospel. And though miles separate us right now, I know that one day miles won't become an issue. Though time might separate us now, one day time won't be an issue. The things that we think now, the things that we believe now, the things that we do now carry with them the eternal weight of glory. So, so I join the Apostle Paul in this affirmation. For I am sure, Paul says, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Christ. God is not done yet, Paul says. And every time I think about you, every time, Philippians, I think about you, I think about you with joy because of what God is bringing to completion in you. So Paul says, it's right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. You are all partakers with me of grace. And in the midst of all the struggle right now, I want you to remember that we are partakers of grace. God's not done. His grace is still sufficient for us. He is still moving amongst us. But here's the deal. Paul had heard some some. Uh, had heard that some were interpreting his circumstances. Remember, he's in prison. He's trained to a Roman guard right now. They'd heard about his imprisonment. They were interpreting his circumstances, specifically his imprisonment, as evidence that God had abandoned him. They weren't struggling to believe in God. They still believed in God. But now they were in that desperate place that even their own Savior experienced on our behalf, where, where they were thinking, God, why have you forsaken us? Why is Paul in prison? Why are we suffering for our faith? You might be asking that right now. Why, God, is this disease uh, set loose amongst us? Why, God, have you abandoned us? Have you abandoned us? Let me stop for a second and... And say, how do you understand what's happening around you right now? How do you understand what's happening to you right now? Right? It's critically important that even in the midst of difficult circumstances, that we grasp what God is doing. For many, particularly those who, don't, who haven't put their trust in God, what is, we are experiencing is just a part of life, right? Even to the extreme of it's a thinning of the herd, right? People's circumstances are completely at the control of nature, whatever that is, or even at their own control. And many of us try desperately to control uh, our vulnerability by our actions. For others who believe what we studied last week, who believe and have put their faith in God, who is sovereign over creation, what we are experiencing is directly a result of God's sovereign control over creation. Thus, it's easy to believe that if it looks like something bad, then God must have abandoned us or is judging creation. But listen to the words of the Apostle Paul as he puts forth in these first two chapters of Philippians, there is another possibility. Life is not random, and just whatever happens, happens. And a sovereign God has not abandoned us, Paul says, right? 
there is this other possibility that God is using what from a human perspective is a negative situation to actually bring himself glory, to actually work out good for his people, to actually advance his kingdom and pour out his grace. Wow. In, in chapter 1, verses 12 through 26, the Apostle Paul describes his own situation. He is in prison. And, and if, if scholars are, are accurate, this is probably around A.D. 60, maybe 61, right before the Apostle Paul was put to death, right? But even in the midst of his circumstances, he assures the Philippian Christians that his imprisonment has actually served to advance the gospel because it's given him an opportunity to witness to, an, to the imperial guard. Now, you have to understand that, that so in Rome, the center of the whole uh, Roman world, uh, people came from all over the known world to be there, to receive their directions, and then they scattered back to the places, to the far ends of the, of the Roman Empire. It's not unlike a, a situation we experienced right here in Evansville with two universities on our campus. People come from all over the world to Evansville. Isn't that crazy? We don't have to go to the world. The world comes to us. And I'm so grateful for, for people like, like Kristen Weinsoffel, for people like Kyle Jones, who minister to those students. Why? Because those students go back, many of them, to their home countries. And if they have experienced the presence of Christ, if they have, have, have become followers of Jesus, they take that back to the world that they return to, and the gospel spreads. So what Paul is saying is even though it looks like his imprisonment is a loss, it's not. It's actually an advance, he says. But what do we do? What do you and I do when we find ourselves in situations that tempt us to doubt God's power, that tempt us to doubt God's presence in our life, right? What do we do? In verses 20. 7 through 30, Paul gives his prescription for this problem. He says, only let your manner of life be worthy. Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that whether I come, Paul says, and see you, or whether I am absent, I may hear that you stand firm in one spirit, in one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, not being frightened in anything. Wow. Wow. He continues, for it's been granted to you not only to believe. It's a gift. Faith is a gift. But it's been granted to you. It's been gifted to you, Paul is saying, also to suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict. While wow, the ability to believe is a gift, but for some, even many, and I would say for most followers of Jesus throughout the world, God also grants the opportunity to suffer. In other words, there's something beautiful even in suffering. So the question is not, will we suffer as a result of God's sovereign will for our life? Inevitably, we will. We will. The question is not, will we suffer? The question is, what will we do when we suffer, right? And Paul, whose circumstances were incredibly challenging, responds this way. Live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel, worthy of this grace, worthy of this good news, right? So what does it look like? That begs the question. What does it look like to live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel, especially in circumstances like we're experiencing now? Well, like Paul, I'm tempted to just cite examples of the way I've seen you living out the gospel even in these last six weeks. 
right? You've been providing for one another's physical needs and you've been caring for your neighbors. You've been picking up groceries. You've been, you've been doing this beautiful thing called drive-by blessings, right? Many of you have been providing financial resources for those in need. Still others have been providing for each other's emotional needs. You've been sending encouraging cards and texts and email. You've been, you've been thinking about those who might be disconnected and calling, and finding some way to bless each person who might feel separate and alone. Still others of you have been providing for each other's spiritual needs. You've been praying fervent prayers for one another. You've been joining together in online groups. You might have thought initially that it was, that it was for your benefit, but, but you discovered that God was using you to bless other people. Many of you have, have, have grown closer as families, and, and, and some of you have taken responsibility to, to lead or encourage one another in family devotions. Oh, the list could go on and on. And I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful for the creative ways in which so many of you are blessing one another physically, emotionally, and spiritually. But this morning, this morning, I, I'd like to go a little more deeply into the foundation of these gospel expressions, right? I'd like to go to the source. Let me ask that question again. What does living your life in a manner worthy of the gospel look like? Well, you heard it just a few moments. God gives, uh, excuse me, Paul gives us a clue at the end of chapter one and then expounds on it powerfully in, in chapter two. But I love the way that he invites us to enter into the story. He asks questions. Cheryl, I think of you. You're such a gifted teacher. And, and you always draw us in by asking questions. And Paul does the same thing, right? He asks questions that we already know the answers to. Let me ask you those same questions this morning. Is there any encouragement in Christ? This is not a rhetorical question, is there? Yes. Is there any comfort from his love? Is there? Yes. Is there any sweet, sweet fellowship in the spirit? Yes. Do you feel any affection for others, right? Is there any sympathy with those who are suffering? What's the single answer to any of these questions, right? Yes. Yes, yes, of course the answer is yes. For the believer to whom Paul is writing, the answer is always yes in Jesus. So Paul says, now, now drawing from all of his letters, let's finish this race well, right? Let's not give up. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. I've been walking in the park and I'm so out of shape and I've been just yesterday increased it by, by walk run um, and, and my legs are feeling it this morning, right? And, and, and there's this point when you've been running, when you're out of shape like me and, 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 and you're not sure that you can go on, right? And you look, you look ahead and say, is there some goal I can set for myself? Yesterday it was a, it was a tree that was still blooming. It must have, it must have been a, uh, the last of the, of the spring trees blooming. And, and I just set my goal for that. i got to make it to that tree, right? Paul says, let's finish this run. Let's finish this race well, right? Just as God is faithful to bring to completion that which he has begun in us, right? Philippians 1, 6, right? Let's make Paul's joy and really God's joy complete. Yes, I know this is, a, this is a powerful thought, and if you have not been with us in the past when we've, when we've explored this together, it, it might be new to you, right? But the idea that somehow my life could bring God joy is just astounding to me, right? It's almost too incredible to believe, especially since I know my life. I know my heart, right? But that's what Paul is saying. Cause me joy, right? cause God joy. A salute to our brothers and sisters down in South Carolina. So what is it that will bring Paul 
and God joy? Well, I'm going to suggest the overarching single word would be unity. Unity, right? Oneness. What does that look like, though, for us, right? It's an, it's an important question because uh, in our culture, unity often is not genuine unity at all. It's compromise. It's, it's two proud people or groups who, who refuse to, to give up their pride, finding some minimal level of pride that allows them to coexist. God doesn't want us to just coexist. He wants so much more. He wants us to commune. He wants us to have a common unity, right? That's where that word comes from in English. A common unity, right? He wants us to be unified. And Paul describes this unity very specifically. Striving, he says, side by side, for faith in one gospel. <laughs> Brother I was just on line with this morning uh, said that history is controlled by the storytellers, right? And, and whichever narrative we're listening to um, is going to control our thought processes and ultimately what we, what we record and even remember about this time. Let's replace, let's replace the the narrative of this world with, with the story of Jesus. Let's, let's replace a narrative of fear and confusion and, and, and conflict with a story of grace and peace and unity. Let's strive together, side by side, for the faith in one gospel, the story of God and how he has interacted with humanity. But he says also it's standing firm in one spirit. In one spirit. We're so divided. What is it that's going to bring us together? Not certainly our own thoughts or opinions or ideas, but, but this gift of God in the Holy Spirit. Let's strive together. Let's, excuse me, stand firm together in one spirit. And we've seen that so many times where Paul says, you don't have to fight this battle. You just have to stand firm. Don't be afraid. Stand firm and see the salvation of God. Let's strive for one gospel. Let's stand firm in one spirit. Let's, let's have one mind. Paul says that several times. Let's have one mind. And let's choose not to be afraid, right? I just invite you that, that chapter 1, verses 27 and 28 would be a great outline. Just take one phrase and explore it on a given day in the coming week. But right now, I'd like to invite you to think deeply about what is this one mind? See, again, people are trying to give you that mind. They're trying to control the narrative. How do we know what is true and what is not true? You certainly can't depend on all the things we used to depend on for truth, right? How do we have this one mind? What mind is it that we are to have among ourselves? And Paul's resounding answer is this. Have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. If we try and, and unite around any human wisdom, any prevailing philosophy, any political platform, or humanistic worldview, we will end up exactly where we are as a culture, contentious and divided, not unified. But Paul says there's another way. Have this mind among yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, right? which was also in Christ Jesus. The secret is not looking to ourselves, but looking to the mind of Christ. And I know that for, uh, for many, that for all of us, that's a step of faith. We have to say this is a mind worthy of uniting around. And so I want to press you on that. What is this mind of Christ? Because Paul gives us amazing insight in in this passage of Philippians, turn with me, would you, to Philippians chapter 2. And then I'll read it and then try and briefly summarize three places that we can focus and then three responses that we can have as well. But turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. 
Paul continues, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. I love that in the ESV. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by become obedient, becoming obedient even to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God highly exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name. So at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So let's look, what did, what did Christ do? He renounced his rights, right? Well, let me put that differently. He renounced his right to his rights. It's probably incorrect to say that he renounced his rights because he couldn't renounce his being God. Don't stumble over that in the form of God. Don't think, oh, he just appeared to be God. The, the idea is not shape like we think of in, in human terms, but really the idea is nature. Though being in the very nature, God, he can't renounce his deity, right? But he can renounce his right to his deity. I know this is astounding. This is an astounding thought, right? That Jesus would choose not to use his rights. I think that's the idea. It's a raging theological debate right now, but the idea that he emptied himself, not so much as that he did not have deity in him, but that he poured out his rights. He gave up his rights to his rights. He poured out his Ability, not his ability, he poured out his right to respond as God. Now, wait a second, some of you are saying, I remember incredible stories, right, of, of Jesus healing blind people, of casting out demons. Wasn't that him taking his rights as God? Wasn't that using his deity uh, to, to bring about these miracles? Here's the rock your world stuff, you guys. No, Jesus was actually modeling exactly for us what it's like to be completely surrendered to his Father's will. Uh, did you follow that? In other words, Jesus is saying, these things that I do, as he actually expressly said, even greater ones shall you do, right? He wasn't modeling for us deity, responding to human situations. He was modeling for us a, a human fully responding to the Father's will. I don't do anything, he said, apart from the Father's will. Wow. Wow. Jesus is modeling for us what it's like to be totally surrendered to our Father. I know that this is this is hard, but this isn't a time to, to cower. This is a time, beloved, to boldly enter into, uh, to engage the circumstances around us, to physically be present amongst one another, to, to uh, emotionally support one another, to, to uh, spiritually bless one another. Oh, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying be foolish. There's a lot of wisdom in, in the simple ways that we can isolate ourselves. But you're not, you're not constrained by those. You can creatively be present and use the power of the Holy Spirit to bless other people even in these amazing times. So Jesus gave up his right to his right. He renounced, but... But also, he humbled himself. In that passage in, in Philippians, he points out four levels of humility, right? First of all, God becoming flesh, and, and even a baby, that's just amazing humility, constraining himself to that body. 
for those 33 years was an amazing act of humility. But did you see what form he took, right? What nature he took there? The word there is doulos. It's, it's not even the normal word for, for servant that we would use, the word uh, diaconate. Uh, it's, it's the word slave. Uh, he willingly made himself a slave to other human beings so that somehow they might experience the grace of God. But then he took on a third level of humility. He died a human death. And we have found all kinds of ways to sanitize it and, and, and make it more socially acceptable, but death is not pretty. It is not pretty. It's humiliating. And, and Jesus took even human death upon himself, and were that not enough, he took upon himself a criminal's death on the cross. He humbled himself to be publicly shamed even in his death. So he renounced his rights to his rights, right? He humbled himself even to the point of human death. And, and, and though Jesus could choose to do those two things, the third thing he could not choose to do, God did it on his behalf. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him three powerful names, right? He gave him, he'd already had the name Jesus, his personal name, which means God saves. But, but God also gave him the title Christ. It's not his last name. Jesus Christ is not his name. His name is Jesus of Nazareth, whom is the Christ, who is the deliverer, who is the one promised by over 300 scriptures in the Old Testament. He is our salvation. But there's a third thing going on here that's so powerful, and unfortunately we've become so accustomed to hearing it that we miss it. God gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess what? See, you said it so easily because, because it's so familiar to you. Do you understand the magnitude of those words? That Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, when most of us think that word Lord, we... We kind of, um, most of us coming from a European background, we kind of uh, think about a lord in the sense of lord of the castle, well, one who has keys to every room on the manor, right? Um, we think of the, the European concept of lord, and that is true. And Jesus is sovereign over everything he lays eyes on, right? He's sovereign over the very creation that he brought into being. But there's something else going on right here. When, when the Old Testament was translated into Greek, uh, they had to find a word in Greek that translated the name of God. We've explored this extensively together in our study of Exodus, even last week. There, God gave Moses and gave every follower of God his own personal name. I am that I am. Yahweh. But in, for a Jew, to say that name was, was, was breaking the Ten Commandments, right? To say that name was, was to risk somehow using the name of God in vain. And so they didn't say it, right? They just used four letters to the tetragrammaton to... to um, to substitute, and later to make sure that they didn't accidentally say the true name, they substituted other vowel points. And we get what in English, now we say the word Jehovah, which is just two words blended together. But, but in, the, in, the, in the Septuagint, the, the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, every time they translated the name of God, they used a Greek word kurios, or guess what, Lord. And the Apostle Paul, every time, if I'm correct, I looked up as many as I could, every time the Apostle Paul uses the name of God, he translates it curious, curious. So do you see what's happening here? Jesus was faithful in renouncing his right to his rights. He was 
faithful in humbling himself, not only before God, but before man. And God raised him from the dead and gave him the name, which is above every other name, right? That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. He is Yahweh. He is God. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting so excited about this. Do you understand the magnitude of this? So, for a Jew, when Caesar, when the government, when the emperor declared himself Lord in Greek, he was declaring himself our personal God, Yahweh. Do you see why it was such an anathema to them? Do you see, do you see why they struggled so much? Beloved, we have to be very careful. Who is it that we give ultimate allegiance to? There is only one, and it's not ourselves. It's not our government. It's not any earthly creation. The only one worthy of uniting around, the only one whose mind is worthy of, of us uh, exploring and committing to the only one is Jesus Christ, our Lord. So when we say we believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, we are proclaiming the most liberating truth the world has ever known. But beloved, know this. One day you may suffer for that proclamation. One, one day, and they may not be far off, even those of us in the Western world will join the bulk of the followers of Jesus and be given the opportunity to suffer for the name. Let's choose now. Let's choose now to put our weight down on the salvation of God through his Messiah, who is Lord. Let's put our weight down on him. Oh God, thank you for this amazing privilege of, of uniting together around Jesus Christ. God, would you give us the mind of Christ? Would you allow us to give up our petty human rights? I'm so grateful for the rights that we have, but, but God, would you give us the courage to lay them aside for the sake of the kingdom? God, nothing is more important than people coming to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And please, God, don't let my pride, please don't let our pride get in the way. As our Savior humbled himself, God, help us to humble ourselves even to the point of death, so that others might come to eternal life through Jesus. And God, I thank you for those who even now, right this moment, are saying, yes, I want to entrust my life to this Savior. And God, our, our hearts just join with them. We declare, God, you are worthy of our worship. We declare, we believe with all our heart that you raised Jesus from the dead to validate his lordship. You exalted him from the grave to validate his lordship. And God, we declare together. We say out loud. Say it with me, would you? Jesus Christ is Lord. Will you say it with me again? Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Amen. Oh, what a great privilege it is to come to the table of the Lord. Jesus challenged us in the table of the Lord to remember him. And today I would just invite you, remember that God saves. Remember that, that he sent Jesus Christ as the fulfillment of all that we hope for. He is the anointed one. He is the Messiah. And remember today that he is God. And he invites you to commune with him.
on the night in which Jesus was betrayed. He took simple bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. I invite you, take the bread, take the body of Christ and break it, pass it around to those who are sharing in communion with you. Depending on whether you have individual cups or a single cup, if you have a single cup, wait and hold the bread to dip it in the cup. If you have individual cups, then you may partake of the bread. Do this, he said, in remembrance of me. Oh, Jesus, thank you that you became flesh and dwelt among us and you willingly renounced your rights. You gave up even your own body, God, for us. We remember you in this bread. Amen. If you are partaking of the cup together by dipping, we invite you to pass the cup and say as you pass the cup, this is the, the blood of Jesus. Do this in remembrance of him. And as you receive the cup, if you'll take the bread and dip it in the cup. If you have individual cups, I invite you to take the individual cup and to drink from it. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you gave your life represented in your blood for us. Thank you that you were, you were wounded, God, for our transgressions. You were crushed for our iniquities. But by your wounds, by your stripes, we are healed. Jesus, we declare that you are God. Jesus, we declare that you alone can save. Jesus, we declare that you are the Messiah. We worship you. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. He humbled him and carry the cross love so amazing love so amazing Jesus Messiah
name 